Before we begin, I'd just like to say that uh, while I'm recording this, it's actually Diwali, so if you hear any unexplained sort of loud popping noises, that is in fact fireworks and not some form of gastrointestinal distress. Just to make that clear. So, Edgeware. Edgeware would be a pretty good name for a sports goods slash lifestyle brand, but it's also a suburb in North London. It's at the northern end of the Northern Line, and its story is one of cutthroat competition. Kind of. Let me explain. You see, there used to be two stations at Edgeware. The other one was about... here. Most of the site is now a Sainsbury's slash a shopping centre. The closed station was built first, opening on the 22nd of August, 1867. It was at the end of a branch line that was begun by the Edgware, Highgate and London Railway. Now, I covered the history of this branch line as a whole in another video, which I will link to above and, if I remember, below. But basically, the Edgware, Highgate and London Railway planned a whole lot of suburban railways that would feed into the Great Northern Railway's line into King's Cross. However, building through hilly territory is expensive, involving a lot of viaducts, tunnels and gradients, and so the whole enterprise was taken over by the aforementioned Great Northern Railway, who stood to benefit from it if it was successful. Something I didn't mention in the previous video was that Edgware wasn't intended to be the end of the line. The long-term plan was to continue all the way to Watford, but for various reasons this did not go ahead. The biggest was that Watford was the territory of the London and North Western Railway, who were rivals to the Great Northern Railway. It wasn't a fight the Great Northern really wanted to get into, the London and North Western was a bigger company. In fact, they were the biggest company. They proudly advertised themselves as the largest joint stock company in the world. The story of the rivalry between the two is way too complicated for this video, but that's why the line went no further than Edgware. At this point, anyway. At this time, Edgware was a small village with around 800 inhabitants. What the railway hoped was that by putting a station here, they could encourage developers. Actually, there's a street more or less opposite the site of the old station called Garden City, with houses dating from 1910. And I strongly suspect that name was chosen to encourage Londoners to move out to what was then the countryside. The line was never enormously popular, development was slow, and the coming of the cheaper trams and buses ate into what traffic there was. But that didn't stop a rival from coming onto the scene in the form of a company called the Edgware and Hampstead Railway. A railway from Edgware to Golders Green. At Golders Green it would join with the Charing Cross, Euston and Hampstead Railway. The Edgware and Hampstead had everything they needed to get their line built except money. So in 1912, the Charing Cross, Euston and Hampstead Railway formally took them over. The Charing Cross, Euston and Hampstead Railway was part of the underground, owned by London Electric Railways. This meant that the new line to Edgware was part of the so-called Combine, the huge group of transport companies, formed by entrepreneur-slash-fraudster Charles Yerkes. All this wheeling and dealing is a bit complicated, but it's going to become relevant fairly shortly, just bear with me on this. The underground line to Edgware opened in 1924. The station was designed by Stanley Heaps, and I always think he tends to be unfairly forgotten among the architects of the London Underground. The brief for the line out to Edgware was a sort of classical look inspired by Georgian architecture. The big selling point for this line was that you could move out to the countryside and commute by modern electric train. And so the stations were designed to fit in with the houses that would be built here and which would ultimately destroy the countryside feel, but that's a whole other story. At Edgware, the style is very Italian. Lawrence Meneer, the guy who literally wrote the book on underground architecture, describes it as looking like a Roman villa, and I think that's quite fair. It was built with a central entrance and wings on either side. Car ownership not being so common in the 20s, it included a bike shed with a hundred spaces. Which I mention only because I think it's interesting that we went from everyone having a bike to everyone having a car to environmental concerns causing a resurgence in cycling. It also incorporated a bus station at the front, and this is where the cutthroat competitive bit comes in. Remember I mentioned that this line was part of the Combine? 
Well, in 1912, the Combine had also absorbed the London General Omnibus Company. This enabled the Underground to serve places beyond the end of the line by bus. But it also meant that they could poach passengers from the territory covered by other railway companies. In fact, they ran a bus route the entire length of the old Great Northern branch, which did nothing to help that line's passenger revenue. As the old saying goes, if you can't beat them, join them. Or be forced to join them, I guess. In 1935, the new works programme was announced. Under this, the Great Northern Line to Edgware would become part of the Underground, as would a number of other branches in the area. They would all be incorporated into the Northern Line. The older station at Edgware would be closed, a new embankment and bridge would be built, and the trains would be diverted into the Underground station, which would be extended to give it extra capacity. Work to extend the station actually did begin. Remember I mentioned that Edgware Station used to have two wings? Well, one of them was demolished to make way for expansion. Meanwhile, in 1940, the older Edgware Station was formally closed. You may recall that I mentioned a planned line to Watford. Well, that scheme never quite died. And the Underground figured that now was the time to make something of it, planning an extension to Bushy Heath and ultimately to Watford. Beyond the buffers at Edgware, you can see the stubs of the planned tunnels. But following the war, Greenbelt legislation did for this extension. No more large-scale building works. And London Transport figured that if they didn't have that extension, then it wasn't financially worth keeping the older branch to Edgware going. In 1954, the whole scheme was officially abandoned, leaving only tantalising glimpses of what could have been. In 1961, the old station building was demolished. Three years later, the track was lifted, and in the 1970s, all trace was swept away by new development. There is one sign of the old station, though, and it's still very visible. The Railway Hotel takes its name from the fact that it once stood next door. But if you want to get to Edgware by rail, I'm afraid you'll have to take the tube. Well, I hope you enjoyed this fiercely competitive tale from the tube. If you did, please do click on the like button and consider subscribing for more. I'm actually working on a video on the Northern Line extension scheme as a whole, the Northern Heights, if you're familiar with your tube history. But it's one of those subjects where the more I research it, the more there is to talk about and the more there is to film, so it may take a while. Plus, it's something that several other YouTubers have talked about in some really excellent videos, so I want to find a take that's different enough to make it worth watching. Anyway, that's enough of my rambling. Thanks, as always, to my kind donors on Kofi and Patreon. You are the bus service to my tube line. And I'll see you all again very soon for another tale from the tube.